because you can't curcumin your way out of this tremendous inflammatory state that you're inducing yourself. Vigor, Steve here. Let's discuss a couple over-the-counter supplements that I feel everybody should use while they're on performance-enhancing drugs. And those are the performance-enhancing drugs that we tend to use in the fitness industry. So those are the anabolic androgenic steroids, the selective androgen receptor modulators, and the peptides ranging from growth hormone, insulin, IGF-1, glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists, the healing peptides, right, the anti-aging peptides or the fertility peptides, all those kind of fall into the same category of what we tend to use in the fitness industry. So this video is not about erythropoic compounds that are being used by people who are into endurance sports, right? Those have a different set of over-the-counter supplements that they need to take to really optimize um, the use of these erythropoic compounds and keep their health intact while they're using those PEDs. So this video is purely for the guys that are in the fitness industry, the bodybuilders, the strength athletes, physique sports, etc. right? Before we get started, I'm aware that N-acetylcysteine is a very good over-the-counter supplement that generally everybody should be using, whether drug-free or enhanced, right? Can be used by anybody in the fitness industry because N-acetylcysteine provides building blocks for proper glutathione production, which is an antioxidant and has many, many health benefits. Um, unfortunately, as far as I know, the United States Food and Drug Administration is going to regulate and acetylcysteine and make that into a pharmaceutical. So for a contingency of this video, I'm leaving that off the list. Don't worry, I didn't forget about NAC, but supplies are limited and at one point it will be a pharmaceutical. And then, well, let's be honest, you might as well look into injectable glutathione instead, which is certainly a lot more potent than oral NAC, right? If you use 2000 milligrams of oral NAC, yes, you will get some health benefits, but it's not anywhere close to 200 milligrams of injectable glutathione three times per week, right? So keep that in mind. We're not going to discuss NAC any further in this video, but it's still a very healthy and suitable over-the-counter supplement if you don't have access to injectable glutathione. So let's start with a cocktail of micronutrients that are often overlooked. Yes, micronutrients again. Sorry guys, sorry to bore you with the micros, but it's so overlooked and I see it on blood work very, very frequently that people that take performance enhancing drugs, they create some sort of micronutrient deficiency for themselves, right? Look at it logically. You're using performance enhancing drugs to increase anabolism, right? You're upregulating all these processes and, and, and gene transcription and, and everything that's involved with that um, goes on at an accelerated rate. And now you're actively creating a micronutrient deficiency because you're not increasing the micronutrients which are involved in gene transcription. So which are the micros that are involved in gene transcription? We have carnitine, right? That's a building block for androgen receptors. Many different studies that prove that carnitine supplementation is able to increase androgen receptor content um, on the cell membrane and within the cytoplasm. So it's a freebie. Well, it's not a freebie, but it's a no-brain supplement that you should be taking pretty much year round while you're using performance enhancing drugs, at least the anabolic ones, right? The anabolic steroids or the SARMs. Carnitine is pretty much a given, right? Because it optimized the process of consuming or injecting a uh, anabolic compound and that compound actually getting to the uh, genes where it starts transcribing DNA because you still need androgen receptors to get that anabolic compound to your genes, right? So carnitine is pretty much a given. It can be oral carnitine, it can be injectable carnitine. I prefer oral carnitine because it's a little bit less invasive, right? And yeah, my experience with injectable carnitine is a little bit limited because it's not that available here in Thailand. And every time I get a brand, um, it's a, a quite painful, right? So I, I would then combine the injectable carnitine with the injectable glutathione and just have one painful experience. But from what I heard recently, at least in the United States, there's some injectable glutathione out there that is reasonably pain-free, right? So there are better options out there nowadays. It's just a matter of sourcing and if you're willing to inject a little bit more on top of the injections that you're doing for your uh, anabolic steroids, for example. Now, 
whether you go with oral L-carnitine or injectable L-carnitine, the dose is a little bit different. Oral carnitine ranges anywhere over 2,000, 3,000 milligrams per day. And then I would look into the L-carnitine L-tartrate formulas, which are, have the highest bioavailability over the uh, acetyl carnitine, or I believe there's a couple other carnitine formulations. And uh, they, they, the fitness industry tries to make many different formulations saying that they have a higher bioavailability. Let's be honest, creatine monohydrate is the best creatine and carnitine L-tartrate is the best carnitine when taking orally. And otherwise you go with uh, 500 milligrams or 600 milligrams of injectable L-carnitine. So whatever delivery mechanism you choose, carnitine is pretty much a given when you're using performance enhancing drugs just to make sure that the antigen receptors um, are sufficient, are a plenty, so you have something uh, for these steroids or SARMs to bind to and start transcribing DNA. Now, there's several different micronutrients which are involved in, tra in the gene transcription process. Those are zinc, selenium, magnesium, vitamin A, and several different fatty acids. Now, selenium is actually very easy to get from your diet. So when you're eating animal meat-based uh, protein sources, right, if you're vegan, it's a little bit more difficult because uh, vegan protein sources don't contain as much selenium compared to the animal meat sources. But if you have 200 grams or eight ounces of uh, a protein source from animals, you're probably already getting 300, 400, sometimes even 500 micrograms of selenium per day. That should be enough to potentiate sufficient amounts of gene transcription. Now, if you want a little bit more uh, regarding semen volume, right? Or you're doing a post-cycle therapy, you might have to increase the selenium intake to, let's say, uh, 800 micrograms per day, right? To really optimize the post-cycle therapy and, and restart natural uh, testosterone production and improve semen volume and semen quality in the process. But while you're using PEDs, and even if you're running ACG or HMG to sustain testicular function, the large majority of the people get a sufficient amount of selenium from their diet alone, unless you really bring down the, right, the protein intake from animal meat sources, then supplementation might be required. And that's the same with vitamin A. So whether you get your vitamin A from potatoes or vegetables, right, the beta carotene, or the carrot, also high in the beta carotene vitamin A. That is usually sufficient to help with the gene transcription. And otherwise, you get your uh, vitamin A from retinol, from beef liver, or eggs, or salmon. Most of the animal meat sources contain a little bit of vitamin A. And that's usually not the rate limiting factor because you're getting sufficient amounts of vitamin A, whether that's retinol or beta carotene, if you're following a basic uh, bodybuilder or fitness diet. Vitamin D3 or vitamin D is also involved in gene transcription. Now, uh, sign of the times, it's pretty hard to get full body sunlight exposure. You need 20 minutes of full body sunlight exposure to synthesize sufficient amount of vitamin D within your skin. Luckily, there's supplements out there, um, right? Most uh, multivitamins contain a uh, thousand IUs of vitamin D3. And then you can always take uh, vitamin K supplements, which also contain maybe 2,000 uh, IUs vitamin D3, so that's already 3,000 IUs vitamin D3, and you can always supplement on top, right? It's usually not really an issue, the vitamin D3, but I would still advise everybody to get around 5,000 IUs vitamin D3 through uh, supplements uh, combined, right? So you'll have to look into the multivitamin, the vitamin K supplements, and perhaps a uh, vitamin D3 uh, supplement by itself to see how much vitamin D three you're getting in, right? In a combination of these over-the-counter supplements. Now the fatty acids that are involved with gene transcription are properly regulated by the body itself, unless you really restrict your fat intake and you're at low body fat levels. But it's very rare, right? How many people get down to sub 6% and then uh, have trace amounts of fats in their diet? Most guys are a little bit higher than 6%, let's say eight to 10% and follow a, a general rule of one gram per one kilo of body weight, right? One gram of fat per one kilo of body weight, or half a gram of fat per one pound of body weight. And that's usually sufficient to synthesize sufficient amounts of fatty acids, which are required for gene transcription. I do notice that having a little bit of fish oil with each meal has a myriad of benefits. So if you want to optimize gene transcription with fatty acids, 
Look into having a little bit of fish oil with each meal. It helps with insulin sensitivity, helps to regulate cholesterol levels, right? Many different be uh, benefits regarding uh, omega-3s with each meal. And those will be on top of the chia seeds, the flax seeds, uh, the fatty fish that you might have with uh, meals anyway. So that would be 500 milligrams, 600, maybe even 800 milligrams of EPA and DHA fish oil supplements. Now, the last thing that people should pay attention to is zinc. Zinc, 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 often overlooked. And you can actually see that on blood work, especially the guys that run higher dosages, two health markers that are off, alkaline phosphatase and the white blood cells. Both of those markers are heavily dependent on zinc. Now it's commonly known that zinc plays a crucial role in the immune system and the immune response is uh, significantly diminished in cases of zinc deficiency. But zinc also contributes to androgen-mediated gene transcription or gene transcription in general. So when you take androgens, right, and you're speeding up these uh, gene transcription process requiring more zinc, now you're pulling zinc away from your immune system, which can already lower white blood cell concentrations in the bloodstream and also uh, alter your response to particular diseases. Keep in mind that white blood cells also have androgen receptors. So when there's a lot of free androgens in the bloodstream, they might be able to attach to the androgen receptors of white blood cells and alter their functioning or, or shorten their active life. So by being on anabolic steroids or SARMs, you should also be on zinc supplements, right? You can only get so much zinc from your diet. And zinc has a tendency to be not so bioavailable um, when it's combined with food. Those are the zinc supplements. And the zinc that is in within food doesn't have as much of a high uh, bioavailability compared to some of the zinc supplements that we can take uh, when we take them on an empty stomach. So besides the carnitine, which is pretty much essential when you're on anabolic steroids or SARMs or any other anabolic compound that promotes gene transcription, the zinc is also required. Now, it's very important that you assess how much zinc you're getting from your diet, right? Because there's an upper tolerable limit and there's zinc toxicity, which in most cases causes nausea or lethargy or a, a copper deficiency because copper and zinc both use similar transporters. Right? They, they go through similar pathways within the body. So you don't want to overdo the zinc or take too much zinc for a prolonged period of time. So it's very important for you to assess how much zinc you're getting from your diet and then supplement zinc picolinate or zinc glycinate on top on an empty stomach to bring yourself to the upper tolerable limit or maybe slightly over it, depending on how much steroids you take. And it's very simple to keep track of your uh, blood work markers, right? You can check uh, zinc concentrations within the bloodstream. You can check your alkaline phosphatase levels to see if the, those are not too low, definitely not below the reference range. And it's the same with the white blood cells, right? You don't want those below the reference range. You want them within the reference range, even though they will never be at the top of the reference range. Because again, the uh, free androgens in the bloodstream will lower white blood cell concentrations within the bloodstream a little bit, but at least it won't be due to a zinc deficiency. So. Personally, I take 25 milligrams of zinc picolinate year round on top of the 20, 25, 30 milligrams of zinc I get from my diet, considering that it's not as uh, bioavailable bio compared to the zinc picolinate. Uh, some guys might need to supplement with uh, 100 milligrams zinc picolinate or zinc glycinate just to get out of a zinc deficient uh, state that they're in because they're on a boatload of androgens, right? And they're in alkaline phosphatase is quite low and their white blood cells are quite low or they need to right, go on hormone replacement or a cruise and then supplement uh, zinc at a little bit higher dosages which are otherwise associated with toxicity i believe that 50 milligrams has certain side effects 50 milligrams per day for prolonged periods of time has certain side effects and 100 milligrams is more severe side effects and then 200 milligrams zinc per day would be uh, classified as zinc toxicity immediate zinc toxicity so again, there's a, a threshold of zinc that you can take. And I would personally, I would take 100 milligrams of zinc picolinate during the pulse cycle therapy. And then when the pulse cycle therapy is completed, you can reduce it to, um, let's say, 50 milligrams or 25 milligrams zinc picolinate, given that the alkaline phosphatase is in range, right? There's no much, not so much endogenous androgens that are being produced. And the zinc requirement is a lot less. You're just supplementing on top of whatever you're getting from uh, dietary food sources. 
So those two, right? I know we went over an entire list and we probably went on 10 minutes already just discussing the first over-the-counter supplements you should consider when you're on performance enhancing drugs. The first one would be carnitine and being an over-the-counter supplement would be the L-carnitine, L-tartrate. And the second one would be zinc picolinate or zinc glycinate, right? Whatever dose of zinc picolinate or zinc glycinate you need to get somewhere to the top of the uh, upper tolerable limit being 40 milligrams per day. Personally, I have no issues uh, using 50 milligrams of zinc per day coming from um, dietary sources and a little bit of supplementation. But again, there are cons um, right? uh, toxicity levels and copper deficiencies that you have to think about. Personally, I'm taking a GHK copper right now, so I'm getting a decent amount of copper from my peptides. So those two basically fall into one category just to optimize uh, gene transcription and the androgen receptor pathways pretty essential when you're using performance enhancing drugs now, luckily for us derek's gorilla mind supplement company produces gorilla mode ar gorilla mode androgen receptor one capsule contains 750 milligrams of l-carnitine l-tartrate i usually take those in between meals on an empty stomach because a carnitine tartrate doesn't have the best bioavailability even though it has a higher bioavailability compared to the other carnitine formulations. I take this year round, so let's say four to five capsules per day, 3,000, 3,750 milligrams of carnitine tartrate on a daily basis. I also take that pre-workout, but I don't work out every day, so that fluctuates between four to five caps per day. Now, it helps tremendously with fat loss, right? Absorbing fatty acids into the mitochondria helps to promote androgen receptor density and content of skeletal muscle and it's certainly less invasive than injectable carnitine, which I usually reserve around the time that I'm doing a cutting phase or um, right preparing for a photo shoot. When I want to potentiate additional fat loss, then I go for the more invasive, uh, more cumbersome method of injecting the carnitine. Right? I believe that Merrick Health has injectable carnitine available under doctor supervision. So that will be a place to look for if you're interested in injectable carnitine instead. Personally, I feel that this is sufficient to run year-round. And if you're worried about TMAO, which I'm still waiting for anybody to send me blood work if they have uh, high levels of TMAO in their bloodstream. I haven't seen it up until this day. I wanted to test it for myself, but unfortunately they don't offer these tests here in Thailand. And yeah, I did call every private hospital and clinic to see if uh, TMAO uh, testing in serum, stool or urine is available. Unfortunately, it's not. Still, if you're worried about TMAO because your gut microbiome is producing TMAO and your uh, liver could potentially convert that into TMAO, look into 180 milligrams of allicin, which is an um, extract from garlic. Right? Don't talk to me about FODMAP. <laughs> allicin supplementation doesn't cause any gas. But if you're worried about TMAO, consider combining your L-carnitine, L-tartrate with allicin to uh, inhibit and prevent TMAO formation within the liver. So that pretty much covers the supplements which are I feel are essential for uh, androgen receptor uh, mediated gene transcription, right? That would be the carnitine and the zinc picolinate or glycinate. Let's get into the actual over-the-counter health supplements, which I feel are pretty much required when you're using performance enhancing drugs. First one on the list is citrus bergamot. I feel that citrus bergamot supplementation is essential while you're running performance enhancing drugs that potentiate their anabolism through the androgen receptors because those will change your lipid levels, right? They might change your total cholesterol readings on your blood work. Your HDL might go down, your LDL might go up. And depending on which SARM or anabolic steroids you're taking, and especially at particular dosages, Right? Citrus bergamot is just there just as an insurance policy to keep your lipids as favorable as possible. Now, I don't see a dose-dependent increase with citrus bergamot, so the majority of the people would benefit from 500 milligrams citrus bergamot twice per day, so that's 1,000 milligrams per day total. I don't see any noticeable additional effects. 1,500 milligrams citrus bergamot, 2,000 milligrams. Lipids don't tend to improve beyond 1,000 milligrams, so consider 500 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams, that's pretty much it. And if that's not sufficient, 
besides all the other practices you can put into place to keep your lipids favorable, right? That's the fasted cardio, the fish oil with each meal, which uh, could also improve uh, androgen receptor uh, mediated gene transcription, right? Cardarine, which is classified as a serum, but could still improve lipid levels, right? There's many different methods to improve your lipids, right? Healthy eating lifestyle. Citrus bergamot is just in place to keep your lipids as favorable as possible because it can increase HDL and it can lower LDL and keep your total cholesterol readings within the reference range. And then the triglycerides are mostly being regulated with the L-carnitine, L-tartrate or injectable carnitine uh, methods that you um, are also incorporating. So citrus bergamot is just a no-brainer, right? On a cruise, hormone replacement or just a cycle of testosterone without any oral steroids, right? A, a very basic cycle of just testosterone without any DHT derivatives and perhaps aromacin to keep your uh, estradiol favorable. Citrus bergamot is usually sufficient to keep your HDL and LDL favorable, right? If you're following the lifestyle, right? If you're um, eating uh, horribly <laughs> and you're being sedentary all day, yeah, of course, your lipids are not going to be so good. Or if you're following the fitness lifestyle and you're doing all the other methods uh, that can improve your lipid levels, sustainable methods, then citrus bergamot is a no-brainer. 1,000 milligrams per day helps to keep your lipids favorable. And then when you decide to increase the performance enhancing drugs, the DHT derivatives or the SARMs or the progestogenic 19 NORs, which all uh, worsen your lipid levels a little bit, especially at higher dosages, then you might have to look into red yeast rice or ezetimibe or real statins, right? It highly depends on your individual makeup. And that's why I made that ancillary video, just so you can have ezetimibe on hand in case the citrus bergamot is no longer sufficient to keep your HDL and LDL in a favorable ratio. I found from my personal experience and with my clients that a combination of citrus bergamot with berberine, 500 milligrams before bed, keeps lipid levels a little bit more favorable. And keep in mind that berberine and citrus bergamot have overlapping effects. Citrus bergamot also helps with glucose homeostasis, which is predominantly what berberine does. But because berberine promotes glucose homeostasis, it also has a little bit of a positive effect on HDL and LDL concentrations. So a combination of both, let's say 1,000 milligrams of citrus bergamot with 500 milligrams of berberine, right? That's more beneficial than running the citrus bergamot alone or running the berberine alone regarding glucose homeostasis or insulin sensitivity or uh, lipid concentrations in the bloodstream. So 1,000 milligrams citrus bergamot per day, 500 milligrams berberine before bed. I feel that combination is very beneficial if you care about your health. Derek's uh, Gorilla Mind Supplement Company also sells both. The berberine is in the form of a GDA, glucose disposal agent. You can take that before bed. And the citrus bergamot is also available as a separate uh, health supplement. Unfortunately, I don't have the bottle, so I can't show you. You'll just have to follow that link if you're interested in purchasing. And if you're interested, use that 10% discount code VIGOROUS all right, to save yourself a little bit of money in the process. Another over-the-counter supplement, which I feel is crucial and pretty essential while you're using performance enhancing drugs, especially while you're using oral anabolic androgenic steroids or SARMs, is taro urso deoxycholic acid, TUTCA. 500 milligrams per day, maybe 1,000 milligrams if you're running oral steroids, or even 2,000 milligrams TUTCA per day if you're on that pre-contest oral protocol like a superdrol, a halotestin, right? and perhaps even anadrol at the end, just to come in a nasty, shredded, dense, and hard and full. Right? That's a lot of oral steroids in your system, and you need a pretty substantial dose of tutka just to sustain bile acid flow and production and detoxify all these metabolites, metabolic waste products, liver enzymes, right? everything else that you want to excrete through the liver, optimize that process with a supplement called tutka. Now, I feel that 500 milligrams is pretty sustainable. You can run it year round. Some people will say that Tatka uh, lowers the effect of uh, steroids, whether those are oral steroids or injectable steroids, because it promotes bile acid excretion, which might contain the uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient being a steroid or an active metabolite. I never noticed a difference on a hormone replacement, on a cruise, 
on very high uh, dose cycles with a reasonably high dose of Tetka, I didn't notice any difference regarding anabolism. I only noticed difference regarding health. Liver enzymes uh, are lower. Cholesterol is better, right? Excretion through the stool, uh, stool and all the metabolic waste products, which are uh, otherwise uh, building up within the bloodstream, all get excreted with Tatka supplementation, right? And make sure you have some fiber in your diet because you still need to bind up all those bile acids and the toxins which are contained within. So I feel that the maintenance dose is 500 milligrams of Tatka. And then as you go on oral steroids, you might need 1,000 milligrams of Tatka. You can split that out over uh, two dosages of 500 milligrams. I've, I've been taking 250 milligrams of Tatka morning and evening. And then when I was actively trying to resolve the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is now finally resolved, I was taking 2,000 milligrams of Tatka, 500 milligrams uh, four times per day, right? Or you can space that if you have eight meals per day, 250 milligrams of Tatka per meal, right? Many different ways to run that. I feel it's a very good health supplement to run year round just to keep your liver healthy, detoxify all the metabolic waste products and toxins, which are produced at an accelerated rate while you're using performance enhancing drugs. And right, like I mentioned in this video, I don't think there's any ill effect regarding anabolism or productivity of your cycle when you're running Tutka, right? Just a health supplement that's in place while you're running performance enhancing drugs to keep your liver health going. And while we're on the subject of organ health, let's talk about Estragalus root extract, which is able to lower the inflammation within the kidneys and slowly increase filtration rate, lowering serum creatinine and cystatin C levels over time. Now, it really depends on your kidney function, how much estragalus root um, you're going to need, right? There's very high dosages which have been shown in several studies, like 18 uh, grams of estragalus root per day or nine grams, 12 grams, right? Substantial dosages, quite expensive to run that much estragalus root extract on a daily basis. But kidney patients with uh, almost kidney failure are able to re reduce their cystatin C and creatinine concentrations with very high dosages of astragalus root extract if they run that for several months in a row. Now, for the guys that have a perfectly healthy kidney functioning, right, and they manage their blood pressure by controlling their electrolyte intake or using an angiotensin receptor blocker or uh, ACE inhibitor, right, there are many different methods to control your blood pressure. A maintenance dose of estragalus root extract can be as low as 2,000 milligrams per day just to lower inflammation in the kidneys and promote kidney filtration, keeping them healthy, right? And estragalus root extract has also been associated with the lengthening of telomeres, which again, if you're on a peptide like growth hormone or insulin or IGF-1 or anything else that increases hyperplasia and cell division, right, that might also over time shorten your telomeres. And astragalus root has been shown to lengthen telomere. So it's a good anti-aging uh, supplement in that sense just by itself. Now, if you have slightly impaired kitchen functioning, or you see that your creatinine levels are a little bit elevated, or your cystatin C is towards the top of the reference range, then I would look into 4,000 milligrams of astragalus root extract. I've been running that for well, sometimes 5,000. So let's say 4,000, 5,000 milligrams of astragalus root extract per day, I believe now for three, four years already. And over that time, I, to be honest, I did not see my uh, creatinine really reduce. So it was still hovering around 1.5 milligrams per deciliter when I was training actively. But when I reduced the training intensity, came off the performance enhancing drugs, the anabolic steroids, I was able to get my serum creatinine down to below one milligrams per deciliter. And during this entire duration, I was running 4,000, 5,000 milligrams of astragalus root extract as well. I saw a very significant drop in my cystatin C levels, which at one point a couple of years ago were about one milligrams per liter. And then after introducing the astragalus root extract, I got up as low as the bottom of the reference range while training actively, right? Because cystatin C is not related to uh, training, unlike uh, creatinine, which you know, if you have abnormal amounts of muscle mass, and your training intensity is very high, and you're uh, doing uh, using supplements like uh, creatine monohydrate, for example, or PQQ, or anything else that can change mitochondrial functioning, 
the serum creatinine concentrations might go up. Astragalus root extract might be able to lower serum creatinine concentrations, but you'll see that predominantly in cystatin C, which isn't dependent on the pharmacology or the insane amounts of muscle mass that we tend to carry uh, as bodybuilders. So I saw that my cystatin C came to the bottom of the reference range as low as 0.69 milligrams per liter, which is very, very low. So it's a really good overall health supplement just to keep your kidney functioning and health in place. Uh, might be able to uh, keep your telomeres uh, a favorable length, right? As you're actively promoting cell division with growth hormone or IGF-1 or insulin or any other peptide that promotes hyperplasia. I think for most bodybuilders, 5,000 milligrams, 6,000 milligrams is pretty much a given year round. And if you're just using hormone replacement, you're not on growth hormone or anything else that promotes hyperplasia. I think 2,000 milligrams, right, is more than sufficient to uh, sustain kidney function, keep your creatinine and the cystatinity levels in range, even as you gain a little bit more muscle mass. And just for overall sense of well-being that you're actively putting something in place for kidney health, right? Besides the, the ARBs or the ACE inhibitors or well, a PDA5 inhibitor, like we mentioned in that ancillary video. And of course, Gorilla Mind also has Astragalus root extract, 750 milligrams per capsule. And this one is actually 50% polysaccharides. And we start looking online for other astragalus root extract formulations, even though it's an extract, it might only be 10% or 20% polysaccharide. So this is very high potency. I take 5,000 milligrams of this on a daily basis, sometimes 4,000 milligrams, right? Depending on how many meals I have. I do take these with meals because I want to buffer it a little bit with food. There's no real change regarding bioavailability, whether you take them on an empty stomach or with meals. So I feel that uh, buffering the astragalus root extract with meals, slow gastric emptying a little bit, allows for more sustained release and keep kidney functioning and kidney health um, right improved throughout the entire duration of the day. Now, some of you guys might only need two capsules, 1500 milligrams or three capsules, uh, 2250 milligrams astragalus root extract, which is more than sufficient to sustain kidney health and functioning uh, while you're on uh, hormone replacement, right? Or a moderate cycle with compounds that don't really produce too much metabolic waste products or don't uh, alter your uh, blood pressure. And then the last supplement I feel everybody should be using while running performance enhancing drugs is curcumin to lower systemic inflammation. Now, you guys know my stance on systemic inflammation, especially in the context of uh, synthetic carrier oils which are now easily avoidable, right? I gave you guys the information. So you have a choice not to put that shit in your body and get a very high, uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein readings on your blood work. I've taught you how to avoid it. Now I'm going to teach you to lower systemic inflammation even further. I'm sure many of you guys are already running curcumin, uh, ideally a C3 complex, right? which contains uh, several formulas of curcumin for the highest bioavailability compounded with the bioperine, which increases bioavailability even further. Then there's a, a curcumin phytosomes, Mariva or rhizomes, right? I feel that the C3 complex has the highest bioavailability. Um, what you can always do is um, mega dose turmeric, 10 grams per day should give you a decent amount of curcumin. Also, uh, although it might change uh, your body odor, uh, quite dramatically, so I would lean towards the supplement instead. Now, we run 500 milligrams of curcumin pretty much year-round to keep systemic inflammation as low as possible, while simultaneously looking at the carrier oils, environmental pollutants, a diet strategy that doesn't cause an inflammatory response, or find ways to optimize digestion, like if you have irritable bowel syndrome, that can cause an inflammatory response. And keep in mind, now, when you're using performance enhancing drugs and you're doing strenuous workouts, which increase uh, intensity over time as you get stronger, right? And you increase the workload, the weights, uh, right? Time under tension, all that stuff. Strenuous workouts inherently, especially when you train for hypertrophy, cause an inflammatory response, which is part of the adaptive process uh, resulting in anabolism afterwards. So you don't want to inhibit that, right? 
but you don't want that to lead into systemic inflammation. You see with a lot of guys that over time that they get uh, joint pain, which is a result of inflammation. Now, I feel that joint pain, it, it's better to tackle that with a Boswellia extract, 500 milligrams with meals, let's say 3,000 milligrams per day. I feel that Boswellia extract is highly beneficial when it comes to lowering inflammation within connective tissues and the joints to allow you to continue training with the insane intensity and uh, very high workloads. But if you want to lower systemic inflammation, right, of everything else that might cause an inflammatory response, uh, even when you're taking pharmaceuticals, you'll still get some sort of inflammatory response by piercing the skin, right? Doing uh, injection practices or going on oral steroids, which might cause a little bit of inflammation in the liver because now you have more stuff to metabolize and detoxify with the tatka that I recommended previously. Curcumin is there to keep the systemic inflammation as low as possible, but you don't want to inhibit this adaptive process that occurs post-workout when inflammation goes up a little bit. So you take the curcumin away from the workout. If you work out in the evening, you take the curcumin in the morning. If you work out in the morning, you take the curcumin in the evening. And if you work out in the afternoon, you take the curcumin before bed as well, because the uh, adaptive process that occurs post-workout only lasts a couple hours. And if you take the curcumin uh, before bed, let's say six hours later, you don't inhibit this anabolism that occurs uh, afterwards, right? After the, the workout. I feel that 500 milligrams of curcumin C3 complex is more than sufficient to keep C-reactive protein levels, homocysteine levels, and the overall systemic inflammation uh, as low as possible while you're using performance enhancing drugs, at least the organic carrier oils that your body uh, tends to agree with. And if you're using synthetic carrier oils, because you have no other choice, maybe you're in contest prep and nothing else is available, 1,000 milligrams, even 1,500 milligrams of a curcumin C3 complex or a Mareva phytosome or a rhizome extract, those might be able to slash your high sensitivity C-reactive protein levels in half. But again, over 5 milligrams per liter is already horrible, right? Ideally, you keep them below 1 milligrams per liter if you're on a hefty dose of PEDs. If you see over five milligrams, let's say 10, 20 milligrams per liter, because you're using synthetic carrier oils, maybe you're able to slice it in half and then you have five to 10 milligrams per liter, still way too high. So again, just avoid those synthetic carrier oils because you can't curcumin your way out of this tremendous inflammatory state that you're inducing yourself, right? That you're subjecting yourself to uh, by using these uh, synthetic carrier oils. So if you're actively avoiding those, you're doing everything you can to keep uh, your exposure to compounds that can cause an inflammatory reaction as little as possible. 500 milligrams of a curcumin C3 complex spaced away from your workouts is more than sufficient. I run that year round because besides the reduction in uh, systemic inflammation, curcumin also lowers or improves lipid concentrations, especially in, when used in combination with citrus bergamot and berberine supplementation. It helps with insulin sensitivity and, and regulates glucose homeostasis, especially when combined with berberine, right? It has uh, some benefits regarding a blood pressure management. A lot of overlapping benefits from curcumin, 500 milligrams per day of a high bioavailable uh, extract or C3 complex formula, right? Gorilla Mind also has a C3 complex formula for curcumin. I run this year round. Highly beneficial to sustain health overall while using performance enhancing drugs. I think this video is already way too long, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the eBooks on my website, vigorsteve.com slash shop. If you're looking for personalized advice, you can find the rates to my services in the consultations section. Contact me directly if you're interested. Follow me on Instagram at VigorSteve. If you're interested in purchasing any of these supplements for your own health and well-being immediately and further down the line, when you're using performance enhancing drugs, look no further than GorillaMind.com. You can use my discount code VIGOROUS for 10% off. So you can get these over-the-counter supplements at a discount and run them year-round as well, right? Whether you're on hormone replacement therapy or a cruise or you're following blasting and cruising 
or you're in a hefty cycle for an entire year because you're competing, right? If you're running PEDs for an entire year, use that discount code for 10% off so you can run the over-the-counter health supplements to keep yourself as healthy as possible the entire year as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. Vigor screw, you guys know what to do. I'll see you guys in the next video.